Lord, we thank you that we can gather here because you are here. We thank you that we can be with each other because you are here when we gather together in your name. Open our hearts and our minds to you, to your presence. You see us just as we are. Open our hearts to you that we might receive from you the very thing that you want to give us. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Can you hear me okay if I'm like this? Yes? Okay? Even way back there? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. I, I really don't like to be tied to a pole yet. Um, here's what I want to talk about. And actually, I, I took my cue from what just happened when I came down the aisle and what was happening in terms of worship. Because what I was trying to say at that very moment was that the most important thing about entering into a worship service is for you to speak out of your heart to God. That's the most important thing you can do. You may or may not get the liturgy right. That's okay. You may or may not get all the words and the lyrics of the songs right. That's okay, too. You may not even sing on key, although they did. Um, and, you know, if you're singing out of your heart, even though it's hard on other people, it, it's okay. Because what's most important, I mean, most important, is to speak out of your heart to God. The, we're one of the worst things Jesus ever said about the nation of Israel was what? <laughs> These people honor me with their lips, but their what? Hearts. Yeah, you can talk back, it's okay. <laughs> but their hearts are far from me. And, and there is this real character to it, and unfortunately it's true in a lot of places, that you can sort of roll through the liturgy, or you can even go to one of the contemporary things and there's the band and all of that. And what are you thinking about? Gosh, I wonder who's texted me in the last 15 minutes. <laughs> or what are we going to do after the service is over? In other words, you, your body has shown up. You're there. And that counts for something, by the way. <laughs> but that's really not what this is about. It's not about mere physical presence. It's about all of who you are showing up and presenting all of who you are, including everything that's in your heart to God. Because when that happens, that's when worship really begins to take place. Now, sometimes you just can't. And God knows that. So it's not like if you can't give 100%, God, God doesn't say, I don't want to listen to you. Sometimes we're so broken, we're not sure of what's actually inside of us. Sometimes we know what's inside of us, but we're afraid of it. Sometimes we don't even, we don't know that God actually wants what's in here. And therefore we, even in our worship, even if we're really enthusiastic, we're still in fact keeping God at, at arm's length on the inside. You know how to do that, don't you? Nod your head. And yet none of that is actually what qualifies as the kind of worship that God desires. How do I know all of that? Because in some ways that's one of the lessons out of the centurion story this morning. And it's consistent with the whole flow of scripture. So let's look at the centurion story a minute. Luke writes this story, tells this story, because he wants to surprise people with something that they don't know. Everything is operating against type. We were just in there with the kids, and we did the story of the centurion. And I said, now here's what I want you to do. Stand up. They stood up. Put a sword in your hand. Put a, they put a sword in their hand. They automatically, I didn't even have to say it, they got this mean look on their face. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in com Mortal Kombat video game right now, see? 
And, and I said, that's the reputation that centurions had. They were Roman occupiers, a centurion from century, commands 100 soldiers. So these are people with some significant authority, and they, their rule was absolute. They were in no way answerable for their behavior to anyone in the occupying country. They could steal, they could kill, they could confiscate at will. Their only job was to make sure that nobody fought with each other. It was all about making, keeping the peace even if there was a high price to be paid. So most people in this occupying nation of Israel, under the authority of Rome, the Jews hated, not just disliked, they hated the Romans because they were an occupying government. They had taken over their land. They had literally violated the nation of Israel by their Gentile presence. And there was no love lost on the Roman side either. They didn't care for Jews. I mean... 21st century racism at its worst. So that's the dynamic. And so when Jesus shows up and the Jewish leaders of all people actually say, we've got a centurion we'd like you to go visit. The readers are going, what is this? And as they begin to describe the centurion, he loves our nation. There is no place in the entire Bible other than here when a Roman soldier is being described as somebody who loves the nation of Israel. Because they didn't in any way, shape, or form. In fact, he loves our nation so much, they said, he actually helped build our synagogue. That's like out of his own resources. So this is a very, very unusual man. Second thing that makes him so unusual was he had somebody working for him, his slave, and at that point, you're talking in most, in the eyes of the Romans, slaves were chattel. They were human. They were property. And so if a slave got really ill and could no longer perform his duties and responsibilities, you got rid of it. I mean, his life was worth nothing. So the very fact that the centurion, number one, not only loved the nation of Israel, but also, in fact, actually cared for this slave was a big, that was huge. But the most surprising thing of all, and the thing that amazed Jesus, was that, again, counter to what that centurion knew. The centurion did not go find some sort of local shaman who traveled with the Roman army who could invoke the name of one of the Roman deities, and perhaps, you know, if the, if the centurion paid him enough money, he would do whatever magic was necessary that, in fact, might heal his, his slave. He went to a Jewish rabbi. That, that didn't happen. And listen to the words that this centurion, remember, says to Jesus through the, serp, the emissary. He says, I'm really not worthy for you to come under my roof. That's not a normal centurion talk. I understand the nature of your authority. Because I understand authority. I can say to somebody to go and he goes. Come and he comes. Do it, it gets done. In other words, Jesus, I understand that distance does not matter to your authority. You can actually speak to the sickness that is in my centurion slave, my slave. And it'll leave him if you tell it to. Jesus is shocked. Because what the centurion is saying to him is, he actually is not bound by time or space. You see, even if you're talking about the role of the Jewish prophets, Elijah the exception, it's an extraordinary story because it actually says something about the power of God operating through them. You had to show up. The shaman, the prophet, the healer, whoever it was, actually had to come and be with you, lay hands on you, do whatever magical incantation that he did for anything to have happened at all. This centurion says, I know you're not like any of them. You actually have control over space. And your word can travel distance. It can touch someone. You don't even have to be there. I understand the nature of your authority. And Jesus said, that's what? Amazing. There's only two places in the whole New Testament where it says Jesus was amazed. 
One of them is he was amazed that when he went back home, nobody had faith for anything. That amazed him. At the hardness of their hearts. And this time, he's amazed because he's never seen anybody, much less a Gentile centurion, who understood the supernatural nature of Jesus' authority. And so that combination of humility, you don't... Don't, I'm not worthy. Don't come into my roof. And faithful understanding of the nature of authority got Jesus' attention. And so what happens is, it's almost like an afterthought. He turns around and goes home. I mean, the emissary does. Servants standing up well and kneel. We don't even hear Jesus in the gospel saying anything. I mean, there's no be healed. None of that. It just, it happens. <laughs> But what I want to call your attention to, the very thing that amazed Jesus was the open-hearted humility of the servant, the, the centurion, and his willingness to come in that fashion through these people to Jesus himself. Because that's... See, I want to know Jesus. And because I want to know Jesus, I want to know what amazes him. Right? Right? So what amazes Jesus? What amazes Jesus is when a human being, regardless of what he has done, regardless of his history, and believe me, this centurion had history. He didn't get to where he was by being a nice guy. Pillage, stealing, murder, rape, you name it. He probably committed any sin that you could think of. I don't know that I'm even worthy to have you come into my heart to be near me, Jesus. And see, we have history too, don't we? Not your head. We all have history. Jesus knows that. He's not afraid of it. It doesn't shock him. He is anything but a prude. He knows reality with a capital R. Which means... He wants you and I. What will amaze Him, what gets His attention, is when you and I come into His presence and, and our hearts are open. We're not trying to be liturgically correct. We're not trying to speak out of some sort of religious voice. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> if I used that tone of my wife, she'd walk out. <laughs> No, no, no. It's a matter of speaking out of the heart. Do you have the courage of the centurion to speak out of your heart? It's not easy, I want to tell you. Especially if you're trying to run away from what's inside you. And many of us try to do that. We almost sort of live at two different levels. There's sort of the, the, the me that I show you. And then there's the me that I know that's inside. And the me that I actually may not even want you to get to know. Because I don't like what's in there either. Right? Nod your head. We're being real here, okay? But the wonder of it is, here is the wonder. The wonder is, Jesus sees both the outer and the inner. He wants to come and speak words of healing to the heart that you are trying to hide. He wants to bring words of forgiveness, mercy, to the places where you condemn yourself. He wants to reshape your heart and set it on a new course so that you can speak out of the deepest part of who you are with great joy and with real authority. He wants you to become who He wants you to become. He doesn't want you to keep somehow trying to Put your best foot forward. Always look good and hope nobody discovers the real you. May it not be said of you, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. But the only way that shifts and changes is that if you, like the centurion, are willing to be courageous enough, and this takes courage, it's a lot more courageous than fighting in a battle. It takes courage to speak out of your heart like that. And that's what I was actually asking you to do when we started the service today. Because if you're willing to open your heart to Him, to say the stuff that's really down in there, 
and I just sort of float through. Believe me, that's what gets Jesus' attention. Because that's what He's after. What He really wants is your heart. And if you're willing to open your heart to Him, even if it's in the smallest of ways, even if all you know how to say is, oh, I've never ever done this before. I'm not even sure how to open up my heart to you. That's honest enough for the first step. And He loves it. I want to tell you, He loves it. So please, as we enter into this service today, what's the lesson from the centurion? Speak out of your heart. Tell him what's really going on. Pray what's inside of you, not just what's in here. And allow in so doing, even if it's the smallest of doors, the Holy Spirit to begin to touch the places inside of you where you need to be forgiven and healed and restored where you can begin to experience in a new way the kind of joy and real courage, the peace that passes understanding. So it's not a game, it's not a charade, but he's, you're actually saying to him the deep longings that are inside of you. Whether they be holy or sinful, almost doesn't matter. He'll sort that out. He wants to hear from the real you. And that's what the centurion was courageous enough to to do. Now we're about to go into confirmation. And I want to say to you, it's an act of courage to get confirmed. If, it, if you're thinking it's just a ritual, you are taught right. It's an act of courage because you're willing to say, I'm up here in front of God and everybody saying I'm willing to trust Jesus with my life. Because that's what those promises mean. And I'm willing to do daring stuff if called upon. Or to sit back and let other people take the spotlight if called upon. All I want is to do what Jesus wants for me and wants of me. That's the real meaning. And what will happen is I'll pray, and you'll be praying too, right? Even though you're in the pew and I'm up here. For God to give them all that they need to live out the commitment that they are making. Now in a minute, we'll stop the sermon and we'll go into, okay, what does this look like? Because in the Episcopal Church, choreography has meaning. It's not just hand motions. But for now, to close this sermon up and move there, I want to ask you, are you willing to make that kind of commitment? Are you, even if you've never done it before, be willing to speak more intimately with the God who made you, who knows you better than you know yourself, who loves and cares for you more than anybody you have ever known. And out of that, begin to receive from Him the very thing your heart longs for, which is His gifts of mercy and forgiveness, grace, peace, all the stuff you hear about in church every Sunday. Because if you're willing, believe me, He'll notice, He'll be amazed, and He'll say, Oh, I've been waiting so long. Come, come. So let's pray together. Dear Lord, I know there are plenty of people in this room that you think are pretty amazing too. And you are blessed by their courage, even in the midst of fear, and their faithfulness even in the midst of doubt. And you're amazed when they come even with the very worst things they've ever done and confess them to you and ask for your forgiveness. Because that's what you long to do. So pour out that kind of grace among this group of people, God. Help them to be real with you and courageous in their faith. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.